Hey, good morning, Awakened Church. So glad y'all are able to join us today. Obviously, this isn't the way that we wanted to be meeting, but just want to say that we so appreciate all the kind words and encouragement and the prayers for those that have gotten sick this week. So excited to bring this message to you today. This is actually a message that Pastor Josiah and I got to work on together. Can't wait for you to hear it. But first, I wanted to share a couple of brief announcements with you, some things that are going on uh, coming up in the next few weeks. So first, on September 26th, it's a Sunday evening, we're getting together for a special family night over at Dell Diamond, right across from where we meet at Old Settlers. So we're gonna meet together about 4.30 in the afternoon for a special tailgate party in the parking lot at Old Settlers. We're gonna provide hot dogs and drinks for everybody, and then we're gonna go over to the game at about six o'clock. Tickets are $9 a person, including kids, and so you can find more information on our Facebook page. You can go on to awakentx.org. You can sign up over there. Make sure you buy your tickets, and we will hopefully see you out at the ballpark. Next, wanted to let the fellas know we've got a men's camping trip coming up. We've got all the information on Facebook, but so you know, we're going to be heading out to the wilderness to spend some time reconnecting with each other and connecting with God. It's going to be October 14th to the 16th. That's a Thursday through Saturday. Hey, if you don't have camping gear, even if you've never been camping, that is okay. We've got plenty of gear and plenty of guys who are willing to show you the rope. It's going to be a fantastic time. It's a Thursday through Saturday, so I want you to mark the dates. Get that time off of work and make sure you sign up. Again, you can find more information on the website, on Facebook. It's going to be $25 per person. We're going to take care of everything for you so that all you need to do is show up to have a great, great time. Well, church, like I said, this obviously isn't the ideal way for us to be meeting this morning. But out of an abundance of caution, we wanted to make sure we protected you and protect all of those in our church family. And so speaking of those in our church family, especially those that are sick, I want to just pause for a moment to say a special word of prayer over them. So would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, we're grateful to come before you this morning, but Father, our, our hearts are heavy and, and we're, our minds are on those uh, who have uh, fallen ill this week. Lord, we ask that you just place your healing hand upon them. Right now in this moment, God, would they just feel uh, just the warmth of your embrace? God, in the midst of, of isolation and quarantine, Father, would they uh, just know what it is to truly experience your love and your presence? Father, I pray for your protection over those in our church family. Father, would you just continue to, to just bless your church, even as we're not able to meet together, would we feel a sense of community, would we feel a sense of closeness with one another because of our connection with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. seeing the response uh, in terms of the attendance at our life groups has just been truly overwhelming. Let's see that our church has really taken this, uh, this action seriously of doing life together. We're seeing the fruit that comes from that. The conversations that life groups have been so passionate and so intentional. Right? It's great to see y'all really leaning into doing life together. And so we're just going to jump right into it. First, let me give you a real quick brief recap of the last couple of weeks. If you were with us in week one, you heard about the impact that a group of followers of Jesus can have on the world. Right? That key passage from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 really sums it up. Right? That when we're fully engaged and committed to following Jesus, well then community shows up for one another. Right? When we journey through life together, Right? Not just on those mountaintop moments when everything's going great, but also in those valley moments where we need somebody with us by our side. That's what happens when we're living lives that are fully engaged with Jesus. We serve one another. 
We care for one another. We look for those that are marginalized, those that are vulnerable, those that are poor. We seek ways to serve them and to connect with them. And as Jesus followers, we have the incredible opportunity to impact the world, right? And that was, that was just week one. Week two, we learned that in order to do that, it requires us to live a bold life with bold faith in Jesus. When we set Acts 2, verses 42 through 47, that, those verses we've been reading each week in life, when we set that as the standard, we're able to lift our eyes from the distractions of this life. And we're able to see so much more clearly how our bold faith brings about true transformation. True transformation in our own lives and most importantly in the lives of those around us. So now that we've established that standard, right, now that we have established that we're to live bold lives of faith in community, that's the standard, right? So the result then, how that plays out in our lives, is a genuine love that affects everything in our world. So let me be clear here, church, that when I say living bold lives in community is simply the, the platform from which we launch into the world to show the love of God to others. Living bold lives in community is the platform from which we launch into the world to show the love of God to others. So living bold lives in community that isn't the end goal of this Christian life. Right? That's like climbing up to the top of a high dive just simply to enjoy the view. No, you don't, jump, you don't climb to the top of the high dive to enjoy the view. You climb up so that you can jump, right? so that you can launch out. So today we're going to talk about what it takes to jump, to take that bold action to show the love of God to others. Because church, it's in showing that love of God that God's glory is revealed through us. Remember the mission that we're on is to accomplish God's mission, that His glory would be revealed through us. And so in sharing that love, we do our part in accomplishing God's mission. So this morning, we're going to talk about the very heart of doing life together. The very heart of doing life together, which is love. But before we open the Word of God together, would you say a prayer with me? Father, we're so grateful God, to be gathered together online to hear from your word. Lord, I ask that you would be with your children this morning, that you would place your healing hand on those who are sick, and Father, that your peace and your comfort would simply overwhelm them. Father, we thank you that in the midst of these uncertain times that we can place our full trust in you. Thank you for the blessing of your word. Would you use it to encourage and equip your people this morning? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And well, if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps with you, I'd encourage you to get those out. We're actually going to be stepping back from the book of Acts this morning to take a look at Matthew, starting in chapter 22. And in Matthew 22, what we find is we actually find Jesus, he's getting grilled a bit by some uh, religious leaders of his time. This actually happens three times in Matthew 22 alone. It happens plenty of other times throughout the Gospels. But in Matthew 22, we see it happen three times. So first, the Pharisees, who you might be familiar with, the Pharisees actually send their disciples to go do some of the dirty work. He sends the disciples to go ask questions of Jesus in hopes that they can trap him into saying something that could lead to potentially his arrest or that could turn the people against him. And so they ask Jesus about paying taxes. Right, kind of a complicated question, but Jesus basically drops the mic on him when he gives him the whole give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's line. And so these disciples of the Pharisees, they simply go away. But then the Sadducees come and they question Jesus, but Jesus puts them in their place too. And so where we're going to pick up today is in Matthew 22, beginning in verse 34, where now it's the Pharisees' turn. Surely these mighty and holy men of God would be able to stump this Jesus of Nazareth with their line of questioning, right? Wrong. Look with me in Matthew 22, starting in verse 34. It reads, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? 
And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So here we have Jesus laying out to us the two greatest commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. But then the second, he says, just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now for most of us who have grown up in church, or most of us who who call ourselves Christians, these are words that are pretty common to us. We've come to know these and just take them sort of as as just second nature. But 2,000 years ago, what was going on is that these Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus. Because there are 613 laws that they were asking just to pick one from. But in his typical Jesus way, he doesn't just pick one, he actually picks two. He kind of breaks the rules a little bit to let them know what the most important commandment is. And it's clear here that the Pharisees are really just trying to trap Jesus. It even says they gathered together beforehand. They're not trying to put on some welcoming party for Jesus. They're trying to trap him with this question. This is the best thing they they came up with. So Jesus' answer here, it's profound. He's taken all 613 of the commandments and he's boiling it down essentially into one verse. But his boldness isn't really in the first part of that answer. Because the Pharisees themselves would agree that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That commandment comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, which these men and and anybody who was, was religious, who was devout in those times, they would recite that twice a day, sometimes more. Right? As experts in the law, their primary focus would have been on that commandment as well. Which is why what Jesus says in that next line is completely radical. Look what he says in verse 39. He says, the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But how can loving our neighbor as ourselves be similar to loving God with everything we have? I mean, those two just don't seem to line up. So what's Jesus getting at here? Well, I love the words of Pastor John Piper. He described it this way. He says, The root of our sinfulness is the desire to be happy apart from God and apart from the happiness of others in God. He says, All sin comes from a desire to be happy, cut off from the glory of God, and cut off from the good of others. So he makes it clear here that what we're actually dealing with And this root sin that's keeping us from those two great commandments is actually pride. See, pride is presuming that we can be happy without depending on God to be the source of our true happiness. That we don't need God to find satisfaction. And pride is presuming that we can be happy without caring if others find their own happiness in God. But Jesus, as he always does, he raises the stakes. He's saying that you can't separate loving God from loving others. You can't separate loving God from loving others. I mean, that truth, it was was true for our Jewish friends living 2,000 years ago, and it's truth that we need to hear today. If you love God, you love others, period. It's as simple as that. So try as you might, friends. You can't have one without the other. If you love God, you love people. And see, Jesus' commandment here, it's so radical because it cuts to the root of that sin. It cuts to that pride. There's no doubt that pride was running rampant in the hearts of these Pharisees. I mean, here's a group of guys who were crazy holy. I'm sure they loved God with everything that they had. But did they love others? I'm guessing not. That's why Jesus calls them out and exposes their pride. And I wonder this morning if the Holy Spirit is convicting you of that same pride. If you are experiencing that conviction, friends, know that there is grace for you. That grace begins with acknowledging your sinful desire to find happiness apart from God. That grace begins with acknowledging your desire to live alienated from God. So I assure you, friends, there is grace because Jesus has come to show us a better way. Jesus has come so that we can break this cycle of selfish love. See, Jesus, he came as the sinless son of God. As the one who 
defeated death and defeated sin. He came to be that bridge between guilt and grace. He came to once and for all cure the alienation between us and God. And it's in Jesus that we have the perfect example of love. Look with me at the words written about Jesus in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Church, life together demands that we genuinely love each other. Because we can't do this if we haven't first received the love of God. See, verse 11, it states it clearly. Our love for others is in response to God's love. Our love for others is a simple response to God's love for us. If he didn't love us first, we couldn't love others. So in order to love, here's the deal. We must first look up. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write that down as the first point. To love, first look up. And church, there may be no better example for us to emulate in this than the Apostle John himself. See, John is someone who consistently always speaks about God as love. And it's not just in 1 John. We see this in the Gospel of John. See, in, in 1 John, that verse we just read, he uses the word love 11 times in like five sentences. But then in the Gospel of John, he refers to himself not by name, but as the one whom Jesus loved. Now when you read this, it sometimes feels like some weird flex or you know, some arrogant, boastful you know, uh, statement that he's making. But it's not. This was John's way of communicating the deep and transformative love of God that he encountered in Jesus. So for John, in his retelling of the story of Jesus and his ministry here on earth, he intimately expresses how he needed and encountered the love of God through Jesus. He makes it clear that he was seen by Jesus. He was known by Jesus. He was loved by Jesus. And church, that same true and deep love is available to you too. It can be found in a relationship with that very same Jesus. I wonder this morning if you've experienced that relationship for yourself. I wonder if you find yourself feeling like John. When you pray or when you talk about your relationship with Jesus, do you think of yourself as the one whom Jesus loves? Or does your relationship with him feel more cold, more mechanical or robotic, more reactionary to what's going on in your life? Family, no matter how you answer that question, I want you to know that Jesus sees you. I want you to know that Jesus knows you. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you. He prays for you. Think about that for a moment. Jesus prays for you. Isn't that amazing? And Jesus loves you so much that he left heaven to take on humanity, to lay down his own life for you. Church, he paid the price that you deserve to pay. He conquered death and defeated sin. And he sent his spirit so that you can have hope to overcome the difficulties and the challenges that you face in this life. Church, Jesus wants you to know and to truly experience his love because it's his love that transforms us. It's his love that transforms the way that we think, the way that we live, the way that we believe. His love transforms everything. And until you receive that love, until you allow it to transform your life, you'll be stuck trying to make sense of religion and not experiencing a relationship. Family, I know this because I was there myself. I grew up in church and never really knew what it meant to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. To me, Jesus was some, some bearded white dude 
who walked on water and, and was really just existed on these flannel graphs in Sunday school. Jesus wasn't somebody that I could connect with. He wasn't somebody that I could really like relate to, certainly couldn't approach Jesus. He was just some far off figure. So rather than getting to know him, I just sort of fell in line and just sort of followed the commandments, just sort of checked all the boxes in church. And instead of finding my happiness or finding my satisfaction in him, I, I looked for it in other places. Rather than looking to the one that can bring me that true joy that I had been looking for. Listen, church, if you've been coming to Awaken for really any amount of time, you know that we like to go deep and get real. And the reality is that there are some of you watching this morning that have been stuck in that same religious pursuit of God for years. And the only pursuit, or the only fruit of that pursuit, church, is frustration. Because at the root, you are trying to find happiness apart from God. At the root of your frustration is the fact that you are trying to find happiness apart from God alone. And my friend, you can't serve two masters. Right? We can't praise God on Sunday and then go chasing idols on Monday. We must be fully engaged in a relationship with Jesus Christ to truly experience his love and to be able then to share it with others. So church, let me just say this again. In order to love, we must first look up. So now once we've looked up to recognize that our ability to love God with everything we have is only possible because he first loved us, then really that should change the way that we look at both ourselves and others. So point number two this morning is that in order to love, we have to look in. Point number one was to love, we must first look up. And then to love, we now have to look in. I want you to notice here, when Jesus says that we should love others as we love ourselves, he's not condemning self-love. He's actually recognizing that this is a deep and defining human trait. That's why he says to love our neighbors as ourselves. He doesn't say to love our neighbors more than we love ourselves. Because it's in our nature to love ourselves. So Jesus is acknowledging that desire. He's saying it's not intrinsically bad. And let me be clear here. Self-love isn't taking a bunch of selfies of yourself and putting them up on Instagram. right? It's not treating yourself to spa days every week. That's not the type of self-love that we're talking about here. We're talking about the type of self-love that has those desires for you to have a place to live, to have food to eat, to have meaningful relationships, people around you that, you that you care about, to have protection from violence, those sorts of things. See, self-love is our innate desire to address our own needs. Right? So it's having that ability, having that desire to place the oxygen mask over ourselves before we help our children, before we help somebody else. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's actually a, a really good analogy for us because in order to love your neighbor as ourselves, you have to first love yourself. For some of us, that comes easy. But for others, it really doesn't. It may seem obvious, but it gets overlooked. And I think it gets overlooked because we get it confused with the idea of dying to ourselves. How are we supposed to love ourselves but also die to ourselves? See, some of us, especially those of us who have maybe grown up in church or been Christians for a while, sometimes we get into this like masochistic mindset, right? Where we feel like we have to work ourselves to the bone, destroying ourselves in the name of Jesus. But that's not the case. In church, you see this most often, honestly, in ministry. It's not the only place you see it, but you do see it in ministry. But dying to yourself, church, is not the same as destroying yourself in the name of Jesus. Jesus doesn't want that. I want to go back to another quote from Pastor John Piper because I think he sums up this idea well. He says, in other words, take all of your self-love, all your longing for joy and hope and love and security and fulfillment and significance, take all of that and focus it on God until he satisfies your heart and your soul and your mind. What you'll find is that this isn't a canceling out of self-love. This is a fulfillment and transformation of self-love. Self-love is the desire for life and satisfaction rather than frustration and death. God says, come to me and I will give you fullness of joy. I will satisfy your heart and soul and mind with my glory. This is the first and greatest commandment. 
So church, in order to reflect and display the love God has shown to us, we must first look up, then next we're to look in, and finally, church, we are to look out. It's my third and final point this morning. To love, we must look out. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that it's the love of Christ that compels us. I love that word, compels. It's almost like the love of Christ is pushing us forward, pushing us out of our comfort zone to share his love with others. It's this idea that we're so well loved, so cared for by God, that his love is overflowing out of our lives. We can't help but keep it on those that are around us. See, that's why Jesus' command to love others it isn't contingent on their love for us. It's not dependent on others loving us first. We're simply commanded to love them, sometimes despite how they might feel or treat us. Yes, we love because God first loved us, but we're not supposed to wait to share that love until others first love us. And church, let me just take a minute to call this out. This is a commandment. This isn't just some advice. This isn't a casual suggestion. We are commanded to love others as we love ourselves. Jesus doesn't mix words here. He places us on par with loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's how important it is to Jesus. It's primary importance. So we look up, church, to remember the act of love displayed for us when Jesus' blood was spilled on that cross. And we look in to receive that love and to pursue a relationship with Jesus that satisfies our souls and our minds, but we can't stop there, church. We must look out because there is a world out there that is in desperate need of a relationship with Jesus. There are people in our city, in our workplaces, in our classrooms, perhaps even in your home, that need to know that Jesus loves them. They need to know it, and friends, they need to experience it. And that's why Jesus calls us to follow his example. I want to close with these words out of 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. They read, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. See, we know love because God first loved us. And he showed us his love when Jesus laid down his life. For us. So now Jesus is calling you to do likewise, to take up your cross and to follow his example, to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters. So look outwards, church, because there's a world out there that is in need of the love of Jesus. So look beyond the four walls of awakened church. Look outside of your life groups because God is sending you into the world to share his love with those who have yet to experience it. Church, are you willing to interrupt your plans? Are you willing to step out of your comfort zone? Are you willing to step across the street to share the love of Jesus with your neighbor? Are you willing to simply share the love of Jesus with those that you come in contact with? That's what he's asking of us. Church, let's take this opportunity right here today to actually go and to be the church We send you out that way every Sunday, right, with the reminder that church begins now. So let's boldly share the love of Jesus, not just with our words, but with our actions. And as we do life together, would our fellowship, together as believers at Awakened Church, would our fellowship simply be the platform from which we launch into the world to share the love of God with others? Would it be the platform to which we see hearts changed? That for the platform from which we see lives transformed? The platform from which we see others come to know and experience the love of Jesus? That's the commandment. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love others as we love ourselves. Be encouraged, church.
Would you pray with me? Father, we look to you this morning, and Lord, we praise your holy name. We thank you for the grace that is available to us, the mercy that is available to us because of your son, Jesus, who paid the ultimate price for us in the most selfless act of love that the world has ever known. Lord, would you grant us boldness now to live the lives that are fully engaged with him. And would you grant us, your church, with opportunities to share his love with others. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first. Would we live lives that reflect that? Would we live lives that bring about the transformation of others? We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey family, I hope that word was encouraging to you. Hope God used it to speak to you this morning. Want to make sure that those of you who are maybe tuning in for the first time, that you know that you can join us on Sundays at 1030 at Old Settlers Association right here in Round Rock, Texas. Family, we're looking forward to seeing you next Sunday, September 12th, kicking off a brand new sermon series. And y'all, trust me when I say you do not want to miss these next few weeks. We've got some serious and awesome surprises in store for you. So make sure you join us next Sunday. We can't wait to see y'all. Have a great week.